Real-time systems have many different aspects of design that we need to pay attention to. Now, it's not necessarily more or less than traditional software systems, but they're slightly different. So, in this video, what we want to do is look at a couple of things that are important in our design of a real-time systems. One thing we are really concerned about is our net CPU usage. The utilization really governs how well our real-time system is going to be able to perform. So once we have the net CPU utilization, we want to look at how safe it is from a real-time standpoint for our system to be operating in the manner it's designed. These are all basically mechanisms for measuring how well our system will perform. The other part that we would like to look at is essentially how we look at the architecture of our system in terms of the concept of periodic tasks, how it differs from a standard run, runnable thread, and also a little bit about event-driven systems, pipeline systems, client-server systems, and state machine systems. Each one of these architectures can be used for a real-time system. They each have their advantages and disadvantages. So let's get started. The CPU utilization or time loading factor, which we typically express as U here, is a relative measure of the non-idle processing taking place on the processor. So essentially, utilization is the amount of time that the processor is not idle. Now, on a task basis, when we have what are referred to as periodic tasks, we look at this as the execution period, which is how often it should execute. We look at this by looking at the period, F sub i, and we look at the worst case execution time. Now the worst case execution time is essentially how long it takes to execute the given thread or the given task under the absolute worst case. And we take the period and we say essentially what is the relationship between the worst case execution time and the period. So for example, if I had a task that was supposed to run every 10 milliseconds and under a worst case scenario it would take 2 milliseconds to run, we would say that that task has a utilization of 20%. Our overall system utilization is therefore defined essentially as the sum of all of these individual tasks that are running and what their utilization is. Let's take a look at an example of this. So let's say a system has four processes and what we want to know is what the overall utilization of the system is. So task one measures wheel slip and it has a period of 100 milliseconds and in a worst case execution time of 12 milliseconds we can tell by doing the math that this is going to use 12 percent of the CPU utilization or CPU. Traction capabilities its period, it needs to run a little bit more often. It's a 50 millisecond period, and its effective time is, or its worst case time is every 5 milliseconds. So what we find is that's 5 out of 50, or essentially 10% utilization. Monitor system diagnostics, this is a different period that runs over a 200 millisecond period, so this is of all of the processes the slowest process, and its worst case time is 5 milliseconds, so what we can say is this is 2.5 percent of our processors bandwidth is being used by it, and last but not least send system messages over the network, the period of this is 25 milliseconds, so it happens a lot more often, its execution time is 1 millisecond, so this is 4% of our CPU utilization. So all in all, what we can say is that for our CPU, we've got 12 plus 10 plus 2.5 plus 4, giving us 22, 26, 28.5% utilization in this system. Basically a system that is not very heavily utilized. So this system in theory should be pretty easy to schedule in a real-time fashion. Now the question that you need to ask is what is the range or when do we start to worry about this? Obviously 
that CPU is idle most of the time. Where do we start to have to worry about whether or not we're going to be able to meet our deadlines in a reliable fashion that would require us to really do some in-depth analysis? So typically what we can use is this CPU utilization zones and there is some deep theory to this that we'll talk about when we get into rate monotonic analysis about the schedulability of systems and utilization. So basically what we say here is if we get to up to about 69% we can be pretty safe without having to do a tremendous amount of analysis. But as we go beyond that it gets harder. And there is theory behind this that justifies what these different values are based upon the periodicity of the tasks, how they intermix with each other, and some things like that. We'll take a look at more of that later on. So okay, we've gone through now, we've talked about utilization, we've talked about the ranges that we care about. Now let's talk about architecture a little bit because architecture governs how some of these things behave and what type of tasks we have and how things are going to be impacted by trying to execute them. So in a real-time system basically we use essentially one of five different architectural patterns or possibly some combination of these. Most embedded systems that I've worked on tend to have some subtle combination, but they may have a flavor that is much more like one architecture versus the other architectures. So these architectures tend to be something called a cyclic executive, an event-driven system where we have both periodic and aperiodic activities, a pipeline system, a client-server system, and a state-based system or a state machine system. Let's take a look at each one of these in turn. So cyclic ex executives, really what these consist of are repeated task sequences that continue to execute. Now we define these into what we call a major and a minor frame. So a major frame is a set of tasks. So within a major frame we have n tasks. Here we have n tasks and essentially within each major frame each task runs at least once. So that's our major task. Our minor task that we have on our system here, this is a smaller slice of time within the major frame. So here we see on this graph here, there's a major frame, and each one of these little pieces here is a minor frame. Now the major frame governs essentially one cycle of execution, the minor frames determine how often each little teeny tiny task runs within that major frame. Now the key thing with a pure cyclic executive is we have no usage of concurrency. There are essentially no shared resources, which means with this architecture we don't need to worry about protecting things with mutexes and deadlock scenarios and things like that happening in a at least in a pure cyclic executive model because again we don't have concurrency we don't have things being locked let's take a look at how this actually looks in terms of a system so here we see a cyclic executive the model being set up and we have various functions one two three and four and we have basically a, a timer that sets up the cyclic executive. This timer basically fires on the major period. And within that major period what we have is little pieces of code that we'll call, for example, task A, which I'm going to actually call function 1, label these B, C, and D. So A will get called, B will get called, D will get called. C maybe has a slower period. Then we'll have A being executed and B and then A and B again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then finally, whoops, not D, C, C didn't get called. So what we find out is that C and D are each called one time per 
major cycle. And then these other ones are minor cycles. We can execute or develop this either by having the functions being called in order like this or by actually having an if and a little counter type structure. Lots of different ways to implement that. So cyclic ex executive tends to be one of our simplest approaches to building this type of system. An event-driven system really uses real-time I.O. completion or time-triggered tasks to essentially schedule these things. So what we have essentially is each of these tasks is firing based on some sort of a timer interval. Now this timer may be external to the system, may be internal to the system. That timer that causes these things to run off could actually be, for example, user input. So a task could get kicked off based upon the user pressing something. For example, in an analog brake system, a task will get, get kicked off based on the user stepping on the brake. That causes the car to slow down. That would be an example of an event-driven system if it's architected that way. Now, each of these tasks now potentially competes for resources. So we do have within our system synchronization issues. An event-driven system does have the potential for synchronization. The other thing we have is potentially prioritization as to which task is more important to run. A lot of real-time systems use this architecture and use it quite well, and there's a lot of in-depth analysis that you can do on an event-driven system. Not all event-driven systems are necessarily real-time, but certainly a lot of real-time systems are event-driven systems. A pipelined architecture is a little bit different. Basically, with a pipelined architecture, we use inner task messages to trigger tasks. So let's say, for example, we have a device here. That device collects data, does some collation on it, and then processes it. Now, what can happen here? Maybe this device, for example, is a camera. That camera takes the picture. And so we put it into this data collection. And what we're doing is we're taking three pictures in a row. We collate them. And then we kick off some process every time we have three pictures. And maybe what those pictures are doing is I've got a car driving down my road here like so. I take one, two, three pictures. And I want to see the t distance between the front of the car and here over those three photos and what I can do with that is from those three photos I can now measure the speed of the vehicle based on now typically we would not measure the speed of a vehicle with a camera like this but there certainly are approaches where we can use this type of pipelining I might use something like this or with a pipelined architecture if I wanted to recognize license plates on a car so as you drive through a toll booth the toll booth essentially takes your picture and it will go through some processing, recognize the license plate in a real-time fashion, and after it's recognized the license plate, send or enter in a billing statement to say that you have gone through such and such a toll booth. Please pay this amount for your toll usage. So that is our, an example of a pipelined architecture. Now, pipelined architectures are quite common in certain types of embedded systems. Um, where you have basically one thing that kicks off a bunch of events in, in sequence, and each one of those items can be separated very easily. These connections here can be made essentially by, for example, in Unix, a pipe type system, or they could be a flag going off, messages being passed back. Any of those types of things could kick off these other processes. So pipeline architectures, again, very, very powerful if that happens to be the type of system that you're using. Client server systems, really what these do is these use inner task messages as well as essentially I.O. completions and other things to trigger tasks. Control for the events really maintain themselves at a single node in the system, so I would control the events at each place, but what I do is essentially data flow now is a little bit more separated out in this system.
Um, what we find is that this type of system tends to be a little bit easier for air processing and for essentially debugging versus that pure pipeline system because we can look at things a little differently. Um, what we find with this is task priorities are somewhat minor in the system. Uh, the priorities really are governed more by how messages are communicated between these clients and servers. When we do our analysis for performance, we tend to treat client-server systems very, very similar to a system that is based upon the pipeline architecture, because there are tremendous similarities between the two systems. A state machine, basically, what we find is that we break our system down into a number of concurrent finite state machines. And each one of these state machines model something that is reactive. So if I am in, for example, the initial state and someone presses the engine on button on a car, I go over to the idle state. Whatever I need to do, that task that has to run right in here runs based on that transition and makes things happen. Now typically what we find is a system like this, basically the events are not processed until we have completed our entire transition from one state to another. Uh, so we call that a run to completion semantic. We can't process an event until we've actually gotten to the other state. Um, what we tend to do is we maybe map these onto concurrently executing tasks and some other advanced things like that to make them actually work. Um, where those other tasks that are running will define some of the priorities. We often also will see state machines embedded in other parts of our real-time systems, even if our entire architecture isn't completely based off of a state machine. So state machine systems, very, very common, very, very usable in real-time systems. So when we tie all these together, we can look at the benefits of each one of these systems. So a cyclic executive tends to be simple, deterministic, repeatable, easy to understand. Very, very common approach, especially for embedded systems and safety critical systems. But the problem with these is they're really fragile. If you make one small change to the system, it's very, very likely to break other parts of the system. That's a problem. So we can't use these with things that are very complex. Event-driven systems, these are very, very suited to rate monotonic analysis. Um, they're good statically and analyzable. They don't tend to have a static or dynamically changing load, which is good. But one of the problems with them is they're not really as capable of handling distributed environments. That's a challenge. And there are some issues with if we have loads that are radically changing, um, they don't work quite so well. Pipelines, these tend to be very commonly used in distributed systems where we might have computer A, which sends a message to computer B, which then sends a message to computer C. We can model our system very easily in a pipeline. These tend to be a little bit less predictable because in these communications, we have latency, which is essentially variable. That causes problems when we try to do analysis from the real-time systems. Client server, we've got Corbra and all those other types of architectures that allow us to do things like that. Um, it's a little bit easier to debug these. Um, Object-oriented distributed programs tend to use this client server model. But again, we've got this extra message traffic, which makes them a little bit harder to analyze. Last but not least, state machines. Again, these are good with real-time Corbra and types of systems like that they are a lot harder again to analyze if you have a complete system that's built around a state machine model. So the last thing we need to do is talk a little bit about two definitions here. And that is the definition here essentially of a periodic task. So a periodic task is a process that has to carry out its task at a regular time interval. So essentially it repeats. If you want to look at an example of this, you might talk about a system that polls an input. 
So I would like to poll the input to figure out what the temperature is outside. And what I would like to do is measure the temperature every 500 milliseconds so that I can see is the temperature rising, is the temperature falling. Maybe I'm doing something and I'm looking very, very carefully about am I getting close to a reaction going out of control or something like that. And actually in a system that we're looking at strong reactions and depending on the rate of reaction and behavior, 500 milliseconds may actually be too slow for the system to be pulled. An aperiodic task basically is a process of constraint and start or stop time. And it really can be asynchronous in nature, but it also may only essentially run once. Now if you think about the examples that we have here, a periodic task here, we can set this up essentially as a while loop where we're going to have do something like so, and then we're going to have a wait or a sleep. And we'll go back up and we'll just continue looping around. That is one example. And an aperiodic or sporadic task, this may be a task that fires once. So some of your examples where you've done multi-threading, you'll have a thread that runs once, and that's it. In real-time systems, a lot of our systems tend to be much more periodic in nature based upon what our system is trying to do. So we will see that top definition a lot more often. So all right. That is going to bring this video here to a conclusion.